make sure that your microphone is off um, so you don't get any playback, as well as there's a survey at the end if you would please, please um, complete it so that we can see uh, what you liked and, and things that we can do differently for our next series. Um, thank you for being part of this. Uh, Idaho Youth Move is part of the national organization. Uh, Na national Youth Move, it stands for Youth Motivating Others Through Voices of Experience. It's youth-driven advocacy groups that are spread out throughout the different states. Um, Idaho Youth Move has youth moves within Boise, Gooding County, Nampa, and Pocatello. Today we will have the Boise Youth Move group here to talk about how parents can speak effectively to youth with mental illness, and I wanna thank you all for being here. Um, just an overview, uh, one of the activities and things that Youth Move does is they learn how to advocate for their own recovery <coughs> as well as teach other youth how to advocate for their recovery. And they also go into the community and educate the community on stigma around mental illness. So thank you so much for being here today and I will turn it over to our Boise Youth Move group. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric. I joined Youth Move about four months ago because I wanted to help uh, others with similar situations get over their uh, the stigma of their illnesses, and uh, I just all around want to help people. Um, I'm here today because I grew up with an undiagnosed mental illness, and it caused some uh, issues in our house and my family through the years has learned ways to adjust and adapt and uh, learn how to cope with these um, issues and so I'm here to share some of the things that worked and didn't work. I'm Shelby, I joined Youth Move to help end stigma um, in the community around mental illness as well as to help out and to end my own stigma against my own mental illness. Um, my parents and I have gone through quite a struggle to figure out what works and what doesn't, so I'm here to share some things that worked and some that didn't. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Delaney. Um, I am the president and chair of the Boise Youth Move Group. I joined in August of 2013 uh, because after I was diagnosed, um, I didn't quite know what that meant for me, so joining this group really gave me extensive knowledge on how to handle things and how to cope better, as well as it offered me a lot of support. Um, I also joined to learn how to advocate for myself and others. My name is Kaden. Um, I've been a part of Youth Move for almost a year now. And um, I joined because I really needed to learn how to speak up for myself and how to communicate with my parents and doctors and other people in my life. And Youth Move has really taught me how to advocate for myself and how to communicate my needs. Um, I am here today because I was diagnosed with mental illness at a young age, and I have learned over the years um, a lot of different strategies that have been effective and others that have not been effective, and I would like to share those today. We're here because there are many people out there with mental illnesses, and many of those people are youth. And the parents and the youth are both trying to figure out how to cope with what's going on in their lives. So we're here to help give them a better voice to help them advocate for themselves as well as others just like we are doing today. Um, and it's important to know that for you parents, you're not out there alone. There is a whole community of parents that are out there trying to fix or trying to learn how to cope with mental illness and having their youth have mental illness. Um, so lastly, I'd like to address that everything we talk about today is from our own experience and what works for us may not work for everyone else out there. Everyone is an individual with their own individual needs. So before we can cover the actual strategies that helped us or didn't help us, uh, we want to cover the science behind why some of these strategies might have been effective or not effective. Um, there's many fundamental differences between the male and female brain, particularly in the adolescent years. Uh, males have more gray matter in the brain, so they tend to think in a more linear fashion, step-by-step -step analysis, uh, sort of tunnel vision type thinking. Uh, they bond with others over activities, not through communication. Um, 
And they also have a hard time uh, expressing emotions and talking about the things that they're feeling. Girls, on the other hand, have more white matter connections in their brain, which means that they have a stronger emotional memory. Um, girls tend to bond more through conversations and relationships than they do through activities as boys do. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, another important thing to note is uh, when youth naturally grow up, um, adolescents tend to want, to naturally want more independence, part of the brain development. And it's a struggle between parent and youth to figure out how much independence to give to the youth and how much, like how to be there for the youth at the same time to keep them safe. It can be very dangerous to give too much of either side. So it's a struggle to find the balance in that. Mm -hmm. um, so what we really want to talk about is uh, the physical science behind the adolescent brain before we move on. So. In kids our age, what happens is our amygdala and our hippocampus, which are our emotional memory and our current emotions, are more developed than our prefrontal cortex, which is our braking system. It is the logic and reason behind uh, all the decisions we make. So um, that part of our brain is less developed than our amygdala and hippocampus. So uh, most of our decision making is based solely on emotion. Um, now what happens when you add mental illness on top of that is your brain kind of develops a little slower than average. So it makes it hard to communicate. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we're going to start talking about the positive strategies. Kaden, would you like to start? Yes. <clears throat> One of the most important things for me, especially in the early stages of my mental illness, was learning how to be honest with my parents. It was a struggle for me because I believed that um, sharing my problems with them would stress them out and would add burden and more anxiety to their lives when they already are, um, you know, parenting three children and, you know, it's, it's difficult. Um, and so it was a struggle for all of us because I would... Um, have trouble with panic attacks and other symptoms of my mental illness and I would not share that I was struggling. Um, it wasn't until we sought out counseling that I really learned that it was um, important to my parents to know what was going on in my life. And them watching me struggle and not knowing what was happening was incredibly nerve-wracking for them. Um, and me being able to share openly that I was struggling and having a problem and needed their help was really, really helpful for us um, to open that pathway of communication. Um, yeah. So for me, growing up, my mom and I, uh, we didn't have the average you know, mother-daughter relationship. We never really spent time uh, making that connection. And what happened is a lot of different people who were not fond of my mother um, kind of poisoned my view of her and that made it very hard for her and I to communicate up until I was about 13 when uh, her and I agreed that you know we needed time apart so I stayed we agreed to stay with a friend for a little while and um, once we were both able to recuperate on our own we came back together and uh, you know she she really let me know that she was willing to reach out to me and try it a relationship. And before this, I thought quite the opposite. I thought that, you know, her and I would never be able to reach out to each other. But once she let me know that she was willing to, it really helped establish that connection. Um, another thing she did is she went to counseling with me and we talked things through. And what we realized was a big reason why we weren't communicating was that too many people were interrupting on our conversations when we did try to talk to each other. So one of the coping skills that we kind of, coping strategies that we kind of put together uh, was, I call it isolated communication. Her and I have to uh, be off somewhere by ourselves so that her and I can talk one-on-one -on -one without any interruptions so that her and I are finally able to see the real person in one another rather than having other people poison and toxify the relationship between us. Um, once 
that connection and the communication was in place, uh, my anxiety reduced significantly knowing that my mother was there. And um, I think it is extremely important to make sure that you have established that connection with your child and because it makes a world of difference. Adding on to what Delaney said, she mentioned that her mom went with her to counseling and personally that can be a very great thing. Um, having that parent with you for support can help and it'll also help the parent understand what's really going on with their child and learn some new coping skills. Um, so going on to the positive strategies and techniques that worked for me, um, whenever my mom and I would get in really bad fights and I would be in tears, we needed time apart so I would go over to a friend's house or another family member's house. And when I came back, what made the difference is that I could see my mom's commitment. She would come in, or like when I would come home, my room would be clean because she would clean it or she would leave me a gift, like a poem about her love for me or when I was born or, or um, well, okay, so that really showed to me that she was there and she was willing to work through this with me instead of just let it pass over. And she wanted to help me, and so that was really important to me. And another thing that my mom did with me is we have this connection. We have a uh, baby song that uh, whenever we would both be crying and in tears, she would come onto my bed and we would play the song, and we would just cuddle, and she would just listen to me. And um, to me, that really helped. So I guess um, for a parent, how you can use that with your youth is to find that connection that you have with them and to just remind them that you're there for them and that you do love them. Okay, kind of building off of what Shelby was saying, my mom and I have a similar musical interest, but um, with her, what we'll do is, uh, she's a piano player, so she'll play the piano, the tune to one of my favorite songs, and I'll go sing along to it, and it helps us sort of calm down. Uh, for me, one of the biggest uh, positive techniques that has worked for me was sort of uh, having my mom do things with me. So we try to go see movies with each other every once in a while, uh, or just go out into the community. Um, and just having her there to talk if I ever need it is great, and she listens, she doesn't judge, she doesn't try to um, offer me advice or anything. She's just there and listens, and that to me is really powerful and important. Okay, mm -hmm. would we like to go to the negative strategies? Yeah. All right. Um, so I guess I'll start. Um, so one of the negative things that we really kind of it's happened in my house for a very, very long time, and I'm pretty sure it runs in the family, but what happens is uh, when, my, when one person's emotions get really high and we all get angry with one another, what happens is somehow it turns into us all just kind of sitting in a circle and yelling at one another, and that doesn't get you anywhere. So what we really learned is that we had to um, separate for a period of time, not long, um, but I think it's really important that after you realize that, you know, this yelling and the negative communication that's happening is going on and you're capable of pulling yourself away from that situation, um, it's very important not to not address it later, if that makes any sense. Um, you should always come back and talk about it because one thing that my mom did that we realized after, you know, if somebody got really upset and uh, stormed off or something, especially me, I do that all the time. <laughs> but um, what happens is she'll come and she'll reach out to me. She'll knock on my door and she'll say, hey, we need to talk about this. And like I mentioned earlier, um, usually our decisions are based off of emotions. So when she's able to come and knock on my door and talk to me about what just happened, it makes it a lot easier for me to understand why and where those emotions were coming from because she's able to help me find the logic behind of everything that just happened. So, yeah. I think it's really important. Um, this is basically what Delaney said, not to just 
let your youth just storm off and hide in their room and then afterwards just pretend everything is okay because what happens is they feel like you don't care. It's what they feel from their perspective, um, usually, and they end up bottling up all their emotions and someday they just release it all and it's not good. Yeah, personally for me what happens is if if I can't figure out what happened and how to work through it, I build up this resentment towards the person I had the issue with and it's never dealt with. And that is probably one of the worst things you can do is let yourself build up that resentment. So um, I think it's very important for parents to reach out to their children, especially after uh, emotions are very high. Um, I guess I'll go next. Uh, one of the things that uh, was very ineffective for me is I would also have uh, situations in my family where I would get angry and uh, everyone would start yelling. Typically when one person gets angry, everyone around them gets angry. It's just that cycle. Uh, but sometimes when I would get angry and into these uh, high emotional states, uh, my parents would uh, just tell me to do things, you know, the whole uh, go to your room or you have to do this or this or, you know, whatever it is they're telling me to do. And at the time, it was very ineffective because I wasn't hearing what they were actually saying. The way I had perceived this situation was that they were attacking me and it made my anger get even worse, which in turn made their anger get a little bit higher, and it just, it didn't really get anywhere. Uh, so what we did to work through this is my family and I, we developed uh, sort of uh, code words or, way to I or ways to identify when this cycle is going on. So that way I can say the code word and then everyone knows, all right, we just, back off for a few seconds, let him cool off, and then he'll listen to what we have to tell him. Well, and it's, it's extremely hard when you have a mental illness, or even in general, when your emotions are high, it's extremely hard to listen to other people because you're, you're panicking or you're angry or you're sad, and things just don't sound the way. Like, they don't sound... Like, if you were in a calm state, you would hear it way differently. But when you're like angry, you'll, you'll see it as a threat and it's, it won't help the situation at all. Yeah, um, another thing that happens is uh, when I panic or when I start to freak out, um, I'll either get very angry or I'll panic and I won't know what to do when my body starts to kind of shut down. And what happens is uh, my mom will get scared and the way she deals with fear is through anger. So she'll get angry because she's scared and then I'm panicking because I'm scared and it becomes this vicious loop where we're both just kind of freaking out. And uh, what we really learned is that um, no matter the reason for the panicking, we have to support one another and we have to make sure that um, we're not yelling or trying to be upset with one another because in that small amount of time, there's nothing that you can say that's going to change the fact that that person's panicking. It's important for the parent to be an anchor sometimes. Exactly. In my situation, um, because of my diagnoses, I have panic attacks, which have been extremely difficult for me and my family, especially in the early stages of my mental illness. Um, and what tended to happen with that was um, I would begin to panic and um, my parents would get scared as well. And then they would start to panic. And for me, that reinforced the fact that there was something to panic about. Because, you know, I would be sitting curled up on the floor um, crying and afraid. And my parents would be going, oh my goodness, do we need to take her to the hospital? What do we do in this situation? And it was very difficult for all of us because um, we just didn't know what to do about it. And it got to the point where we finally sought out counseling to help with it. And that, through that, um, I learned some tactics to help keep myself calm and how to prevent a panic attack before it started. And my parents were able to also see the warning signs of when it was coming on um, so that they knew to prepare. So going off of what Caden uh, is talking about with panic attacks, I wanna talk about uh, 
a little bit how to handle a panic attack because what happens is when somebody is having a panic attack, other people generally don't know what to do and they tend to run around like a chicken with their head cut off. Everybody's panicking when somebody's having a panic attack. And I think it's extremely important that um, for you to stay calm while someone else is experiencing this because if they see you calm, by nature, they're going to want to be calm themselves. Um, another thing you want to do is help them get breathing because uh, sometimes with panic attacks, people tend to hyperventilate and that allows either too much oxygen to get to your brain or not enough oxygen. And the big thing is you want to sit and example, again, lead by example, um, you want to breathe with them in through their nose and out through their mouth very slowly so that you can calm their breathing down. And if they can't do that themselves, and if you can't help them with that, what you want to do is get them a paper bag so that the carbon dioxide is brought back to the brain. Because uh, if there's too much if there is too much oxygen in the brain, your body becomes tingly. And for the person having the panic attack, they sometimes become immobile. So it's very important that you make sure that their breathing uh, is normal again. And once you stabilize that breathing, you're able to kind of go from there and ride it out because it becomes much easier. So. Okay, so what I would like to talk about is um, an issue that my mom and I have had for a while, but we are working through it, which is good. <laughs> um, so whenever, well not whenever, but a lot of the times when I would be crying and I'd be going to her, um, what she would do while I was telling my story is interrupt and give me advice. and. She may think it was helping, but from my perspective, what it felt like was um, she was normalizing my problem. Like, everything I was saying is something that happens to everyone and that I shouldn't worry about it because I'll get through it. And that didn't feel good to me. Um, it wasn't very validating. And I think it's important to understand that even though your child may have some of your genetics, they may be made from some of you, basically, um, your child isn't you. They are, their brain is not fully developed and they will not make the same decisions that you make. And even if they were an adult like you are, um, they're still their own person. They still have a different perspective on the world. And they are going to handle it how they're going to handle it. For me, the best thing that my mom could give to me was to just listen instead of give me advice. Because that way I knew she was there for me and she was there to support me. Exactly. Um one thing that I've had to tell my mom is, you know, even if my problems are normal, I kind of like to feel special sometimes. Let, I just need you to listen. I don't need you to tell me that everybody's experiencing the same thing because what that does is invalidate my feelings and, make me, and it makes me feel insignificant. And I tend to find that with a lot of other youth as well. So. Yeah, the, the last thing uh, most youth want to hear when they're talking to people about their problems is that their problems are normal. It makes them feel like uh, you don't particularly care about their problems because it's just something that's normal. Yeah. Another thing that I know specifically doesn't tend to work well for people, especially for people with anxiety, is telling them to calm down. <laughs> that tends to, it's, it's like asking somebody who's paralyzed from the waist down to walk. It, sometimes we are just incapable of calming down and telling us to calm down makes the situation worse, so. Sometimes uh, telling them to calm down implies that there's something to be nervous about. Yeah. <laughs> it's like if, if your airplane pilot on the airplane goes onto the intercom and says, there's absolutely nothing to worry about, you immediately start to worry. Oh yeah. Um, another thing that I wanna cover real quick is um, medication. Now, sometimes, people need, do need to be medicated for uh, their illnesses, but that's okay. That's, so many people are medicated and it can also take a very long time to um, figure out the right balance of medications. Like for me, it's taken years and I'm finally getting to a very balanced state, but um, it's very important to know that if uh, you do need to be medicated, that it's okay. And you're, you're not the only one and it, it's not the end of the world, basically. It's, I think it's really important to address because a lot of people think that being a, on medications or going to counseling kind of makes them a freak or abnormal, and really it doesn't. Oh yeah, no. Tons of people go through this, and it's to help better yourself. Yeah, 
if it helps you, if that's what works for you, then that's what works for you. And I think it's very important to understand that. Okay, so lastly, um, it's important to address that for all you parents out there, you are not alone and you should not feel guilty for having your child with your child to have mental illness because it is not your fault and guilt will not help the situation at all. Um, but ever, there's a community out there that is there to support you. It's also important for parents to know that as much as their child needs to focus on self-care and taking care of themselves and all of that, it's also important for the parents to focus on that as well. It's all right to seek counseling for yourself um, because it can be extremely stressful to be living with a child with mental illness. And sometimes to be able to be there fully for your child, you have to seek out help for yourself as well. Yeah. You and that's okay. Sorry. You have to be able to, uh, you yourself have to be in a good place in order to help others. And that's one huge thing I've learned through Youth Move. So, so Boise Youth Move. We do have a question that I want to bring up before you go further in, because it does um, go into what was stated before. And the question is, what is an alternative to saying calm down? Um, what my parents say to me is, are just some simple reminders to keep breathing calmly. Um, I personally have asthma, which means that when I have a panic attack, I start to hyperventilate and that triggers an asthma attack, which can cause some very serious problems. So what's very important for me is for my parents to be there and say, it's okay, just remember to breathe. Um, a very helpful breathing tactic is to breathe in through your nose, count to three, and then breathe out through your mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and so that as an, as an alternative to saying calm down has worked very well for me. For me, um, when I am in a state of panic, I feel like the entire world is ending. I feel like everything is wrong and nothing can go right and everything I have done is just the end of the world. And I need to be reminded that it's going to be okay. No matter what happens, you get through it and you're going to be okay. And what my mom does for me is personally, I'm a very, touchy person so what she'll do is she'll rub my head or she'll pat my back but I know a lot of people don't like to be touched especially during a panic attack so that's just something that's very specific to me. I think it's just really important to let them know that they're safe. Mm -hmm. They're not going to get harmed and I, don't know, I think that's the most important thing. Thank you. So we have another question. Um, Patricia wrote, have Okay, so I have really messed up communication in the past with teens with mental illness. How would you go about making reparation, which is repairing, when it was done out of ignorance? What you really want to let them know is that you're willing to try. You're willing to try and fix anything that happened. You're willing to move forward with that person. And um, that's kind of something very specific for me and my mom for a long time because we both messed up that communication uh, growing up or as I was growing up and um, the thing that really helped repair the relationship was no matter what happened she let me know that she was willing to try for me and that was extremely important for me. Or it might also help to give a heartfelt story about how you didn't really know what mental illness implicated or what it meant. I know there have been quite a few people that I've had dealings with in the past that didn't know about mental illness and they treated me a certain way because of it. And I'm good friends with some of them now because uh, we reconnected and they uh, explained that they had no idea how hard it was to have a mental illness, but later they did research and they learned a few things. And like uh, Delaney was saying, just that they were willing to try. Yeah. And uh, that they've learned how to sort of handle it. Yeah. Great. And so, um, let's go into another question that was posed. Um, how do I talk to the rest of the family about my child's mental health issues? I think that the important thing about that is first to have 
um, to make sure that it's all right with your child for you to be sharing that. For some people, mental illness is a very, very private thing, and they don't want people to go around saying, oh, did you know that you know, so-and-so has anxiety attacks or you know, things like that. It can, be, it can break that sometimes very fragile trust between you and your mentally ill child if you go around um, telling people about it. So you really need to make sure that it's all right with your child first. Yeah, and again, um, a lot of times parents tell, want to tell the family and stuff to explain some of the actions that um, your child does. And again, it's very important to talk to your child about it. And But sometimes you're also, um, the parent goes and tells the family about it because they don't know what to do themselves. And I think, especially in that situation, it is extremely important to see a counselor for yourself. It's also important to, um, when you're talking about it, make sure that people know that you stand by your child and you support them. Because there's a lot of stigma behind mental illness. And you could get a reaction of, oh, so your kid is weird. And so it's important to let the people know that you are supportive of your child and you will stand by your child. Absolutely. Yeah, so my mom always says that mental illness isn't a casserole dinner. It's not one of those things where if you're struggling and you're the parent of a child with mental illness, people don't bake you a casserole. Um, and a lot of the reason for that is like there is a lot of stigma behind it. And so if you are going to uh, talk about your child's mental illness, and ma make sure you have uh, their permission. And that just be careful how you phrase things because certain things can be misinterpreted. And um, mental illness, it's not something that there should be a lot of stigma about. It's easily treatable once you go through the long, long process of finding that right treatment. But, um, and try to make sure you understand what the illness is before you try to explain it. Um, just, you know, general rules. Okay, and so here's another one from Patricia. There is a stigma in society that if you have a child with mental illness, you must be a really bad parent. How would you address this? Can I take this one, you guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, my family has a lot of experience with this. Um, the idea that if your child has a mental illness, you're a bad parent. First of all, no, you're not a bad parent. Like, my mom is one of the most amazing parents out there. Uh, my dad tried really hard. You know, lots of people do struggle with this, and they work really, really hard at it. They're not bad parents. They're just parents caught between a rock and a hard place. They don't know, a lot of times they don't know what to do. They don't know exactly how to handle it, how to fix their issues in the, ha in the family. And a lot of the times they're suffering because they're watching their child suffer and they don't know how to help. And uh, my mom tells me there's nothing worse than watching your child suffer and knowing that there's nothing you can do because you don't know how to help. Well, and we don't even um, understand a lot of the times where the mental illness comes from. It could be genetics or it could have been caused by something small in their childhood that you never would have thought. So it's not your parenting skills that have caused your child to have a mental illness. And there's no perfect parent out there that can just get everything right. Yeah, and I think what's really important is you don't want to focus on your past. Um, you want to focus on recovery and the future. You don't want to sit and stew over, oh, what did I do? Oh, I feel so guilty about it. Because that tends to just make matters worse. I also think that this is another situation where it's really important for the parent to focus on self-care and perhaps getting counseling for themselves. Because um, the stigma in society behind mental illness is something that, though there are a lot of people working to change it, it's, you know, it's probably going to be around for a while. And there are people who just won't understand that it's not the parent's fault that they have a child who's mentally ill. And that parent can be doing everything that they can, um, like my parents have done, to try and be supportive of that child, and they'll still be criticized. So that's why it's really important for parents to focus on self-care and that kind of stuff. 
Um, okay, so Cindy asked, when you are out in public and something comes up that brings out anger, panic, confusion, is there any advice on good moves or bad moves to help you out while still saving face? That's a really good question, and it's one that I'm still trying to answer myself. Um, for me, if I'm out in public and I have a panic attack or something, it means my anxiety has been high for a long time, and I think it's very important to recognize the level of uh, tension and stress before any of it happens. I think it's always very important to be aware of that level of stress, but... Um, when you are in public, you know? Uh, one thing that I always do is if I start feeling angry or upset, I'll um, excuse myself to the restroom. And um, I have a number of uh, classical songs on my phone that are just sort of soothing, calming music. And so if I need to, I'll excuse myself to the restroom for one minute, just pick a soothing song and just listen to it and it can help sometimes. Sometimes I need to go through two or three before it's calmed me completely. But just uh, having sort of some kind of thing that you do that can calm you down, just excuse yourself to a quiet place and uh, perform it and you, you get back to normal pretty quickly. This is also another situation where um, medication can come into play. Personally, the way that I have two ways that I handle panic attacks in public. Um, I have been prescribed a rescue med that I take that keeps me calm when I know that I'm going to be going into a stressful situation. Um, and that's very helpful for me because it helps me keep a level head in situations where I know in advance I'm going to be stressed. I also, you know, um, Saving face when you're having a panic attack is very difficult. What, another thing that I use is this little guy. He's an aromatherapy um, stuffed animal. And he, I carry him in my bag. And um, when I start to get stressed out and stuff, I have trouble with contact when I'm having a panic attack. But having something to fidget with is very helpful. So I can excuse myself and um, just have a few minutes to calm down. Yeah, um, looking into homeopathic remedies to help handle anxiety is very important. Um, for a while, I went off medication because I was able to deal with it with aromatherapy and calming lights in my room. I mean, it, it, but it is something that you have to work at. Um, specifically for me for a while, it was um, aromatherapy oil. I just put it on like my clothes or something, and I would be able to smell it and sometimes like peppermint is very calming to me and um again like having like a weighted blanket or a weighted stuffy or something i mean that's kind of another way to handle anxiety without medication as well and if you're in a room like in public it's okay to just excuse yourself for a minute even if you're with your youth just take them out for a second it, it's better to be not in a crowd mm -hmm. so it would be good if you could find a place that wasn't surrounded by people Calm down. Yeah, just, just somewhere that you feel a little bit more comfortable and you can uh, clear your thoughts and get yourself back to ground. Yeah. Okay, so that was all great information, by the way. So the next question is from Lisa. And her question is, what would you say defines mental illness? Oh. <sighs> Oh, <laughs> mental illness is it's a very broad spectrum there's lots of things that fall under it I personally would define it as uh, any condition which affects the brain in a way that makes it harder to function in society in a chemical way I yeah mean. I would yeah. say it's um, most mental illness can be defined as simply as a chemical imbalance in the brain mm -hmm. Or sometimes it's neurons misfiring. It's just yeah. some difference with the and brain it's, that it's causes adverse effects. It's hard to catch it at first sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's really obvious. Other times you might just think your teenager is being moody or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, with mental illness, sometimes it can be genetic too. Like I know in um, some parts of my family there has been mental illness before. 
um, which may be some of the cause of mine, but there is also environment caused mental illness. Um, and it could be something as small as getting bitten by a dog as a child. I mean, there's just so many things that can trigger mental illness and it's very hard to pinpoint it most of the time. So defining mental illness in general is kind of a hard thing to do because it's such a broad subject. So another question is how do you get youth to be part of their own recovery? How much do you give them? How much are they part of it? One thing that's difficult about that is um, particularly with, at least in my own experience, with things like depression, sometimes um, the youth doesn't want to seek help right away. Now, at least in my case, that did change. Um, but that can be very difficult when your mentally ill child is so um, kind of embroiled in their own illness that they don't feel like they need to seek help or they don't feel like help is going to do anything for them. And I feel like in that situation, it's important to be very patient and encouraging. Um, I deal with this issue with somebody that I know. Um, if they don't want to help themselves, it's very, very hard to try and help them yourself because it has to be a decision that the person makes. And um, kind of forcing someone to go into recovery is not quite recovery. So I, I came around at a young age and I wanted to get better at a younger age, but I know uh, the person that I do know, has it, they are still not in the right headspace to want to recover. So it's... However, sometimes, uh, sometimes it is necessary to sort of give them the first push you know, like they might not want to help themselves, but if you get them on the right meds, it might um, convince them that, oh, hey, recovery is actually pretty neat. I know for me personally, um, uh, my mom leaves most of my self-care to me. I um, call in my own prescription a lot of the times. I uh, get myself to counseling meetings. Uh, I... My mom still comes with me to psychiatry appointments, but I normally just go in by myself and while she sits in the lobby. I think, I think it's important for the parent to let their youth know that they are, you're, as a parent, you're not mad at them. And I think it's important to not put a ton of pressure on them because sometimes that can just um, cause someone to just shut down. Before we move on, one thing that I think we should cover is that medication is not always a quick fix. There is a lot of stuff that you have to do yourself. You have to, I mean, there's counseling and there's talking it out and there's all of these different communication things that you need to do rather than just medicate yourself. Because again, with, with this person I know, they think that the only way to fix anything with uh, their mental illness is to be medicated and that has led to addiction and many other things and I think it's very important to understand that while medication can be a great complement you also have to uh, put other work into it it's not just a quick fix yeah the medication for me it was a giant step forward but I had to spend a year and a half to two years after that um, finding out other things to sort of benefit the effects of the medication and to finally get myself to where I am today. Well, and medication is supposed to fix the short-term problems, but you yourself have to find a way to fix your long-term problems. I mean, sometimes medications can be long-term, but typically you need to change your behavior or change your way of thinking, and that can be very hard to make someone else do that. It's mostly a decision that they need to make. Yeah, it's hard just your, on your own to try and decide, hey, I need to change this behavior. I'm, I'm working on that right now uh, because my behavior leads to very stressful situations for me. And um, it takes a long time to change habits that have kind of been stuck in place. Okay, so the next question, and I believe this goes back to when you guys were talking about um, how how parents 
um, can talk to their friends and family about their child with mental illness. I believe this is where this question comes from. So it says, if you have experience of seeing people go through similar challenges to what your child is going through at the moment, are you not supposed to share that story in order to feel like you can help? I, well, I think you can share the story, but I think it's important to tell them that um, for your child, it may not be the same way and that there may be a completely different path for them. But I think and sharing it is illness, okay. Mental illness is radically different for everyone that experiences it. And um, it's very, very rare that you will find um, two treatment or two people with mental illness that have exactly the same treatment plan. And, and you know, I'm going to stop you real quick because I think I misread this. Um, I think what the question is going to is if your child approaches you and wants to talk about something that is happening to them and you have experienced and seen other children go through the same thing um, and you have that experience, um, are, do you not share that story with your child? Um, what? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Um, do you not share that story with the child and, and you know, make them feel insignificant and things like that? Like, how do you do that? Um, my mother has a degree in psychology, so she has a lot of experience with um, different mental illnesses, and she has a lot of opinions on good ways to manage um, my own mental illnesses. And so um, what we do is when I come to her with a problem, we start the conversation with, she asks, do you want a poor baby, which is just straight up sympathy, her lending kind of an ear to listen to what happened in my day and what I'm currently struggling with, or do you want advice? Because she's always happy to share her own experiences and her own um, opinion on what's going on. And sometimes I really do need her that little push and that opinion on some different strategies that could be helpful to me in the moment. And sometimes I just need to vent and get everything out of my system. So what is really helpful for me is just opening that conversation with asking, with her asking what I'm looking to gain from the conversation. I think that's a, I think that's a lovely way to handle yeah. it. I mean, that's probably one of the best approaches I've ever heard. <laughs> so yeah. Another way you could possibly deal with this is if you are going to share those stories of uh, other people that you've seen in similar situations, uh, don't have names involved. Um, like just say there's a person that I know, um, like uh, I know that sometimes it's okay to share the stories um, as long as there's no names attached to them because uh, the stigma most of the time, the main issue people have with talking about their mental illness is they're afraid that people will think of them differently because of their mental illness. So if you just uh, tell the story without any names, I would still get the other people's permission first, but um, I feel like it can be okay. Okay, so the next question We've got very good questions coming, um, so this is great. Mm -hmm. Connection with your parents seems to be very important. What can parents do to learn to connect with their kids but not overdo it, giving you space and independence, or making you want to avoid them? So that's a hard thing because, as Shelby talked about earlier, um, at our age we also want to try and establish that independence on our own. And I think it's important to specifically look for something that you share with your child. Um, as Shelby was saying, you know, her and her mom have a song. And um, I guess it's, I think, a good way to bond with your teen in general at all times is, is an activity. Um, just something that you both enjoy and through that activity you generally get talking and that's how it worked for my mom and I for <laughs> it's gonna sound weird but for a long time my mom and I we bonded through eating and <laughs> we would just we would go out and we would order these humongous amounts of food and we would just eat until we were going to explode and for some reason that got us talking so I think it's really important to just try and find something that you enjoy whether that be eating whether that be a song whether that be going to the movies just that activity I that you can do it's important 
not to tell your kid we're doing this on whatever day. I think it's more important to maybe talk about how you would like to spend more time with them and ask when you can do that because I think it's important not um, to demand your kid to hang out with you because then it's like being forced to sit with your parent and just awkwardly uh, talk to them. Something that you can do is like maybe pose it as a question that one of their friends would ask them. Like I know a lot of my friends, if my friends want to do something with me, they're like, hey, do you want to hang out sometime this week? They don't say, hey, we're going to see a movie on this day at this exact time at this exact place and you have to be there. They yeah. Say, hey, do you want to hang out sometime this week? And you're like, yeah, sure, just, you know, whenever. And as long as it's something the teen enjoys doing, uh, find something that you can bond over. Maybe allow them to choose the activity. Yeah, that yeah. works too. What my mom and I have talked about a lot is there's a fine balance between your parent being your friend and being your parent. And I think sometimes it is important to approach your child as a friend rather than a parent because that, just sometimes. But, um, I mean, that has worked for me because there was always just the parent thing. But I think just relaxingly approaching your child is a good way. And not doing it, like, every day. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> Still their parent. <laughs> and one thing I think you should keep in mind is that you may have to do something that you're not particularly interested in to explore your child's interests and not just say, you know, well, let's um, go do this thing that I like to do. So, um, like, one thing my mom and I do is we go makeup shopping together. And she doesn't wear makeup. She's not, you know, like, a huge fan of it. It doesn't really... You know, it's not something she's interested in, but I love just going and looking at everything, and it makes me happy. And so one thing we do is, you know, once a month at least, we go out and we just do something I'm interested in. And that's huge for me because I know that she is really dedicated to building that relationship with me, and that really shows it. So, so far, if anyone else has questions, please feel free to write them in. If we don't get them at the webcast, but you still want to uh, send them in, then the youth will be more than happy in which to answer those through emails and things like that. Um, how, how would a youth get involved in Youth Move? Uh, it was actually really easy for me. I just um, kind of showed up. Yeah, you do. <laughs> we're always happy to welcome new people into the group. It really is just as simple as finding a youth move near you or, you know, having your child find a youth move near them and then just having them show up. We're very welcoming to new people. Oh, yeah. Um, so, and we're always happy to see new faces. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the more the merrier. And we, we're very welcoming people, I think. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. um yeah for yeah, me yeah. what really helped was I brought someone with me which you can't see but yeah. <laughs> they're in the hair <laughs> um and it made it less scary I guess yeah because it can be scary going into a group of people you don't know um so that was actually pretty scary for me so I actually she's the one who yeah. got me to go to youth move <laughs> and so it was very helpful for me to um, have a friend there that because it brought the stress down yeah. so um, also yeah. we're on Facebook um, you can find us it's just youth move Boise our little icon it's it's a teddy bear I it's think a, it's like oh right? it's youth move Idaho okay because um, the youth move Idaho page has all of the youth moves in Idaho I guess the Youth Move Boise page is just ours, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about that. But um, yeah, you can find us, just search through uh, Youth Move Idaho, uh, and you can ask to join the page, and you can look at all the stuff we've done in the past, and all the activities that we've posted, and uh, I think our contact information is on there too, if you'd like to join. Um, and yeah, we're, we're pretty accessible, I think so. We're friendly. <laughs> Yeah. And so what are some of the things that you guys have planned? So right now what we're really working on is we have a, um, we recently received a grant called Dare to Dream. And uh, the money from the grant uh, we are going to use for our next community project, which is going to be, well, 
what we're going to be doing is um, designing these t-shirts with a cute little, you know, I, a cute little buddies, like. That represent mental illness. Yeah, uh, like there's one for ADHD and there's one for anxiety and depression. And what we're going to do is we're going to go out into places in the community like um, the YMCA or the Boys and Girls Club and we're going to try and reduce the stigma of mental illness because it's not something that people should be afraid of. And I think starting at a very young age and letting people know that um, this can happen and it's going to be okay is a good thing to do. Yeah. So we'll have these t-shirts to hand out to kids and I think we're all very excited about it. We've worked very hard on it. Um, we're making great progress. Uh, Caden here wrote the grant which was awesome, and the rest of us have been a huge part of planning, and um, yeah, we're all very excited about it. And um, just a reminder that youth move chapters within Idaho all fall under Idaho Youth Move. We have a group in Boise, a group in Nampa, a group in Gooding County, and a group in Pocatello with hopes to open more in Idaho so that we can continue to help youth um, as these young people have done learn how to advocate for their own recovery and how to educate their community on stigma. Um, I want to thank you guys for being so open and honest. Um, this is a program that we hope to continue uh, with Boise Youth Move. Um, so please keep in tune and um, hopefully in the next few months we will have our next webinar series. Thank you everyone and thank you Boise Youth Move. Say goodbye everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for watching.